The Drum Candy Podcast is brought to you by Drum Factory Direct. What's up, everyone? Welcome into episode 58 of the Drum Candy Podcast. This is your host, Mike Dawson, coming to you from Drum Factory Direct in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. This week, I am passing off the interview duties once again to Tom Went. Tom got the modern jazz great Lewis Nash to sit down for an interview. This is a really good one. If you're not familiar with Lewis's work, just Wikipedia his, his discography or go to All Music and check it out. You can pretty much pick any record he's ever been on, and it's going to sound incredible. But I'm going to let Tom do the introduction duties, so let's pass it over to Tom Went or Lewis Nash. Hey folks, drummer Thomas Went back to guest host another episode of the Drum Candy Podcast. It's such a pleasure to be here. And today you're in for a real treat. I have the great honor of spending some time with the one and only, the great Mr. Lewis Nash. And it's gonna be a pleasure to talk with him. Lewis is on over 400 recordings, that's right. And we're gonna be talking about uh, his long and varied career, all kind of different aspects of his journey with the drums. So let's get started. Wanna welcome everybody to uh, this new uh, episode of the Drum Candy Podcast. It is such a pleasure to have the opportunity to uh, spend this episode with one of uh, the great modern day masters of not only the drums, but of uh, the great American art form of what's commonly called jazz music, although there are other titles. <laughs> Want to welcome uh, the great Mr. Lewis Nash. Thank you so much for, for joining us, Master Nash. Thank you, Tom, for having me. It's my pleasure. Great, man. Well, as I as I was telling you on the phone the other day, you know, there there are a lot of uh, different kinds of drummers uh, who watch and listen to these podcasts. So, you know, while most folks will, will be familiar with you, I'm sure there's a few folks who might not be all that familiar with you. So I thought we could kind of start by by going all the way back. Mm -hmm. uh, you're originally from Phoenix, Arizona, and right. uh, you, I believe you started playing in elementary school, like like a lot of us do in the school mm -hmm. band. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and uh, and then you went to Arizona State University, but you didn't really major in music. Is that correct? That's correct. As a, as a matter of fact, I I didn't know any professional musicians personally, you know, like my older siblings or my parents didn't have musician friends, uh, so to speak. So the life or of the, of a musician or the, and the aspiration to live the life of a musician, uh, professionally at least wasn't really a part of my mindset at the time. I mean, I had played, as you mentioned, I started in elementary school in the, about the age of 10. And I joined the school band. We had a school band. I was in the fourth grade. And so I started to learn the basic, uh, you know, elementary school uh, note um, repertoire or, or material mm -hmm. and uh, playing in some marching situations with the marching drum strapped around me and, and learning basic snare drum technique and all that kind of stuff. So learning how to read rhythms. And so playing the drums had been a part of my life from that time going forward and and prior to that even i was told when i was a kid i would go outside and pick up two sticks and put surround myself with cans and boxes and all that all that kind of stuff so it was a part of my life but um i didn't necessarily have the aspiration that okay this is what i want to do i want to travel the world and uh, that wasn't when i got to arizona state university i enrolled as a broadcast journalism major because mm -hmm. that's, that's what I, the career path I thought I wanted to pursue at the time. Yeah. And it, it was really sort of during, during your college years and then right thereafter that you really became serious about, about playing and about, mm -hmm. uh, and about the music too, correct? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, th this is something that I, that, that I kind of want to revisit uh, different times during our, our session today, but was wondering if you could talk about uh, in your early development, things that, that, that you were practicing that were really sort of, that you feel were essential to your development? Are there one or two things that, 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 that you used to work on that seemed to open, open more doors for you as a player? Um, I guess it would be, in all honesty, difficult to say what opened doors as it relates to what I was practicing, because there's so many variables that come into play as far as doors opening. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> But um, I will say that there were things that I practiced that 
later on, as I looked back and reflected back on those things, I could see that those things were helpful in the situations that I found myself in. So, for example, um, I used to just set up a ride symbol only, and I would play along with Jimmy Cobb uh, on the Miles Davis recordings, like Live at the Black Hawk, um, uh, the kind of blue, of course, anything that had Jimmy Cobb, because I, there was something about the feel that he had that I was trying to emulate at that time. Mm-hmm. And so um, I felt like if I could capture that part, it was that, that prominent aspect of keeping time on the drum set and jazz, then all the other stuff would come. <laughs> I could get that. But that feeling that happens on that symbol is, is what oftentimes gets people phone calls for gigs. <laughs> yeah, that's true. At least, at least from our chair in the, in the jazz situation. So um, that's one thing. And not only Jimmy Cobb, I did it with, with Kenny Clark. Um, I did it with um, Philly Joe, with, with Max. Just just checking out how the master drummers, Roy Haynes, what, what they were doing. The, the subtle differences in their approach to um, timekeeping on a cymbal. Then those subtle differences would have to do with touch, would have to do with spacing, would have to do with um, that kind of thing, you know. Mm-hmm. And so, um, and then I would experiment with where on the symbol, in terms of pl- where you place the bead while you're keeping time, uh, where on the symbol allowed me to um, hear the sound back in a way that I liked hearing it back. So. I mean, so I was experimenting with those kind of sonic things early on. Mm-hmm. That's not necessarily a technique thing. It, it is in a way, but I was really checking out what the sound that was coming back at me and how that, how I um, could compare that to the sound I was hearing coming from these records with these great players who I like. So that's one thing. Um, then, um, as far as the rudiments go, I don't, I don't have a background in uh, drum and bugle core or uh, drum drum core type things or and actually after elementary and junior high i wasn't in the marching band because i was playing football so i couldn't do both <laughs> so i didn't really get a lot of that but i taught myself basically you know i just i got i remember i had a little cassette tape of this rudimental drummer frank arsenal i think was his name and i and i i just had this there's a picture of him on there and he's standing there with his drum you know strapped around his shoulder and i just i just taught myself i emulated what i heard on there okay this is what this is this is this this is that and so that's generally how i familiarized myself um wow. i know you probably weren't going down that road with your question no, that's okay that's all right <laughs> go go ahead um so i practiced those kinds of things and then the other thing i'll say that was really important early on is that i played along with recordings a lot and so early on, it wouldn't have been, I'm going back before college, you were asking about once I got to ASU, but prior to ASU, I didn't really have much uh, jazz knowledge. Um, I played in high school in what was called the stage band early on. And then it, I think before I graduated, it became known as the jazz rock ensemble. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I didn't, you know, until I got to the university, my knowledge of the history of the music, who the great players, you know, a few moments ago I mentioned, you know, uh, the, the drummers who I was emulating. I forgot to mention Art Blakey, of course. Mm-hmm. But but um, uh, I didn't know any of them, of the, their names, why they were important, what they brought to the table in terms of their contribution to the music. I didn't really know any of that. Mm-hmm. So to the point where... And then I'll get to what I was doing. I, I, I'm still on your question. Um, <laughs> the reason I um, I didn't grow up in a household that where jazz was listened to. Um, a lot of the a lot of R and B, the the funk and R and B and and soul music of the day. Um, uh, my mom was really into the blues and of course gospel and and spiritual music. So that's what I heard. I I wouldn't have been able to tell you who Charlie Parker or Dizzy Gillespie was or what they meant to anything and eventually i you know began to hear those names and wonder why they were important but uh, early on i didn't hear any jazz growing up in my house so um once i 
when I was so getting back to your question about what I things I did, um, I was playing along with records. I was playing along with James Brown records. I was playing along with the Meters. I was playing along with all the Motown hits. I was playing along with all that music that I was hearing, the blues that my mom had, Muddy Waters, BB King, Howlin' Wolf, Lightning Hopkins. So that that I was rooted in that stuff before I knew anything about ding ding da ding. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, those are just some of the things that I that come to mind right away based on what you were asking. Wow. Yeah, that's it's it's funny. I, I basically learned by playing along with records, too. I was taking rudimental snare drum lessons, but I, mm-hmm. I really I, I kind of learned the same way. And it, it's it's an interesting thing. I, I, I don't know if you experience this, too, but I with my own students, when it comes to to learning how to play this music and as you were saying, to really internalize uh, and assimilate the feel of it it's all, all drummers play the the cymbal beats so differently yet it's pretty mm-hmm. much the same rhythm and it's almost I almost it's very difficult for me because I, I never want to tell them how to do it because they're yeah. going to have their yeah. own way to do it but you you have to listen to those masters so that you have a have an understanding when it comes to your students how do you sort of broach that topic of 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 the 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 feeling of this music? Ah, uh, that's um, boy, that's quite a broad. Sorry, <laughs> but um, no, no, no. Um, well, generally, I'll after I listen to their to what they do um, in a complete way. You know how they play the entire drum set. What's the left hand, right foot, left foot doing against the right hand? Then I'll then I'll probably cut out the both feet and the left hand and just focus on what's happening with the right hand. And um, I'll often listen to different tempos. You know, if it's a new student, for example, just to kind of see how they interpret various tempos because um, that'll give me some clue as to how, how they subdivide and what, what's going on with with subdivision. So, and then if I get a student who comes from a rock or pop or commercial, for want of a better term, uh, environment, and is just learning about playing jazz. Often, in order to get them to uh, understand how the swing feeling re- really feels authentically, I'll have to have them play a, a 12-8 um, so that they can get that eighth note triplet, rolling triplet feeling established internally first before they start to try to swing, because then that takes them, that's an easy way to move them away from the duple oriented straight A kind of feeling that a lot of the commercial music has. So wow. I often start with, with saying, okay, let's, let's play, I'll listen to them play jazz ride at various tempos, and I can tell pretty much if they're straight A oriented and there's not enough triplety things going on. So, <laughs> and I'll, then I'll basically just break it down and say, okay, let's, these are triplets. One, two, three, two, two, three. Eighth note triplets. So, and I'll speed that up to it. So they can get ding, 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 ding. And then in, while they're playing that, I'll, I'll have them either, I'll play triplets myself against them while they're playing that, or I'll have them, if they're able to, play triplets with their left hand. So they have da 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 ding, 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 ding. So they feel that. And then one, a lot of times that is the one thing that they need to kind of get them oriented to, oh, okay, so that's how it feels. And as they speed up, they see how the triplet feel is, is difficult to maintain as you get fast. And so then that kind of changes the character mm-hmm. to more of a, a, of a duple feeling or straight eight feeling at the faster tempo. So once they understand that, then, then I think I can begin to work with them um, and understanding the other things to do to help to, to do with the music from the drums, you know, the jazz context. Wow, that's that's really interesting. I never thought of doing that, man. I might need to adopt that. I'll put a check in the mail to you for that. I, I appreciate <laughs> that. No, that's, that's, that, that makes total sense. I never thought of approaching it that way. That's, that's mm-hmm. great. Um, so let's let's kind of switch gears for for a minute. So after after you left college, you you got to New York to join uh, the great Betty Carter's trio right. in uh, 1981. I think is is mm-hmm. that the year you got there? 
Mm-hmm. So you know, as you as you sort of made your way on onto the the national and international stage, you know, you you began working with so many different people in the jazz world. And one of the things, one of the first things I wanted to talk to you about was, as you started to do that, what what were th- what were some things in your playing that you saw needed? That that you needed to work on uh, as you as you sort of got got into those upper echelons of 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 this music. Were there things about your playing that you knew you needed to address and and work on? Yes, I'm sure anyone who's who enters that field of uh, activity is going to quickly begin to. If you have a awareness of a certain nature, you're going to begin to uh, say, oh, "Okay." You hear your because you're starting to hear your peers and and your mentors, you know, regularly and in close context, you know, close proximity, I should say, and that can be very revealing for a young musician who's just beginning to step onto the scene. So you can imagine going to one of my first festivals in Europe with Betty Carter, Max Roach, and Tony Williams both were on the program mm. in Rome. Uh, so, I mean, there you go, baptism by fire. And so, uh, but getting back to your question in more specifics, um, let's just go back to Betty, start with Betty Carter. So often she would, you know, she would turn to me and say, kid, she called me kid for four years. Um, <laughs> kid, I heard that already, you know, find something else, you know, so she was she was always about freshness, you know, um, being uh, spontaneous and not leaning on some things that you've tried and true things. You know, that's the safe things. Mm-hmm. She didn't want it. Safe. <laughs> she didn't like safe. <laughs> so for me to start with someone who doesn't like to play it safe was probably a really great thing for me in terms of being open uh, to trying different things on the same tune night after night. And being okay with, okay, maybe it didn't come out the way you would have wanted it to, or you you envisioned it, or it, it wasn't quite um, as uh, as uh, didn't have the clarity or the or the technical um, thing that you wanted it to have. But the fact that you were willing to be daring and step out there and, and attempt to do it was more important for someone like Betty. So I began to learn that early on, mm-hmm. and. I was, uh, it, it's a part of my way of thinking to this day. Um, I, I learned to find things that certain things will work um, in terms of sound and sonic things. So I may not be as, I may not change those things as much. You know, like the part of the drum set I'll use on a particular tune or a particular section of a tune or given the parameters of the instrumentation, I'm going to have this kind of sound. So sound may not vary as much. And I think that's why we hear people's personalities, you know, in the way they sound. We hear it in the things they play, but in the way they sound, you know. So Absolutely. Um, I think being able to, that's where we, there's a consistency of, that kind of runs as a thread of continuity through a person's career or through their recorded output or when you hear them gig after gig after gig. And if it's okay that a person is trying to you know, do new and creative things because the essence of their sound or whatever is consistent. <laughs> mm-hmm. You follow me? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> I totally follow you. Um, another thing I wanted to ask you about, and this, and this is sort of, um, you know, this, 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 this sort of goes along with, with the educational, uh, aspect of things. Um, you know, being being a largely a freelance player, um, dealing with a lot of different kind of musical situations, some one right after the other, in the way that things are today with budgets and and time constraints and scheduling, when it comes to being able to digest 
uh, new music quickly. I know for me, that's that's always that's that's that can be a challenge when you you know when you have to do something and, and you might get a rehearsal and someone might email you some weird right, looking charts right, and right, you know you right. you you want to be in the moment and bring as much as you can to the music. How do you deal with those situations where you have to? You know, learn and digest music quickly. I'm I'm curious to 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 hear yeah. how how you approach that. Um, it, yes, it's correct that I've had to do that many times and still do. And let's say, let's take for example, if someone sends music ahead of time, we don't have time to rehearse. Please, you know, they implore you to please take a look at the music. Um, so the musician who waits to the last minute and doesn't look at the music and and just shows up at the studio and that's the first time they're seeing it um they that person has not only um handicapped themselves <laughs> but they've actually uh done something which could hinder the music being what it actually could be that day <laughs> so sometimes we don't have much choice if we're busy extremely busy or maybe life's challenges distract us and we have things that don't even have to do with music that need to be done and that's understandable so sometimes that may be the case but in a general sense if you have the lead time then take take and make the time to just familiarize yourself with 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 what's being you know which what's written uh kind of um do a, a, a quick, and if, sometimes you'll have an MP3 along with it or MP4 along with it, but maybe you won't. So whether you do or not, if you take the time to just go through it, even if you only did it once, even if you only had time to do it, you know, if you had 10 minutes, <laughs> I'm talking about definitely more time than that, but at the very minimum, go through the entire thing and, and just see what's written there. <laughs> if you can... The more familiar you are and the more prepared you are, the, the more you give yourself an opportunity to not be stuck to the page and to be able to create what's not on the page. <laughs> so um, in, this, in the sense of um, how experience comes into play with this, I'm, I must say that the more you have an opportunity to do it, the more you're challenged with this type of situation, the better you're gonna get at it. So having done it, multiple and numerous times over the course of my career it's on i have a, a sense about something once i look at it for a moment about how it's going to feel how it's going to go and those kind of things or i know from the way people write certain things whether it's how they write rhythms or the way they put descriptive terms of, above the bar lines about what they want to hear if someone says an afro six or something like that or someone says uh um Oh, um, so it's a three four, but they don't want it to be a, a waltz. They want it to be uh, like a lilting, you know, one to the bar kind of feeling. And so you you begin to learn. And if those things aren't there, and you know, I listen to the MP3 and I hear that's what hap what's happening, I'll put my own descriptive terminology above it so that I know. Okay, right here, that I want to do a, I want to be play more open. And I may write that myself based on what I hear. They may not have asked that but what my ear hears tells me okay let me write this so i'll remember this part so i i really kind of go through the music with a fine tooth comb, comb if i can and make notes and pencil on the parts and that way just it's a trigger me seeing the word any kind of word uh um, afro six or seeing the words uh, float or <laughs> whatever i might write there that trigger familiarized me with, oh yeah, that's what this section is. And then I'm not, it doesn't take me four or five or six bars into it to go, oh yeah, right, that's what happens here. Mm -hmm. You know, so basically just uh, preparation is really important in the sense that it's not a matter, it's not about executing the part perfectly and reading every rhythm perfectly. Sometimes that may be what's necessary, but, I, but what I'm talking about now is familiarity which allows you to be creative in the moment mm -hmm. yeah you know sight reading something that's real specific and getting all the rhythms right is a different is different than what i'm talking about right now that is another thing that's important can be important too 
Yeah, mm-hmm. f- yeah, for sure. Kind of along this this same line of, of of questioning, I guess. When you're in the recording studio, do you are are there things that you do differently than when you play live when you're in the studio? And if so, what are some of the things you do differently? Hmm. Um. I guess only in the sense that. Um, you know, live we don't have the headphones on, generally speaking, and hear the sound in our ears like that. So I try to make adjustments in the studio which will which will give me as much of the live feeling as I can get. They're two different monsters for sure, but I may take one ear off so that I'm hearing because if you don't, to not hear the you want to hear the attack of like the cymbal or the, or your stick on the drums. For me, it helps me to hear it acoustically. Mm-hmm. So I'll have one ear half off or half on. And because I think that electronic signal may give you some different feedback and make you play with a different attack than if you could actually hear it acoustically. So I'm hearing maybe one ear will be all the way on and one will be kind of half off or, or off. And then, Um, I realized that those microphones are so sensitive they can pick up things in a recording session that in a live session may not be picked up. So I'm careful about certain things, you know, sound-wise, but I'm also aware of certain things. So when I play the brushes, for example, um, in a live situation, there's going to be a different, different nuances that are not picked up in a live situation that are actually picked up in a recording situation because there's <laughs> there's no ambient noise of a crowd or the outdoors or or the club or whatever and also um, um, the microphone is right there um, by the drum and, and the different types of microphones are used in recording so I might have to change the amount of pressure that I'm a, exerting on the brush to get a certain sound that and where I'm playing live I might push harder mm-hmm. <laughs> and in the studio I'm gonna lighten it because this it, this is this microphone's gonna pick up everything you know that I'm doing so I'm aware of that and so I try to adjust have the my own volume adjusted of myself if I'm hearing it through the headphones then that's one thing and then I try to hear it live as well because I don't want to I don't want to change my um the whole idea is I don't want to necessarily change my um, mm, the, the strength of attack or the way that I've uh, um, touched the drums based on this electronic signal through the headphones. <laughs> you know, I want it to I, I want to be free to play the way I play when I'm playing live, and so um, I make adjustments in in terms of that often. Okay. Hopefully that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it totally does. And I, I can sympathize with all of that for sure. <laughs> uh, um, yeah. So, you know, I, I, I'd, I'd like to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, the the sound that you get and, and, and all of that. So as far as, as far as how you tune your drums, I mean, I, I, I can hear from the records, your, your general tuning has been kind of the same throughout the years. Would you agree with that? That's probably true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as far as how you approach it, how do you approach it as far as your tuning goes, just just sort of in general? Um, I I, I like to say that some often I tune by feel in terms of, so I may start with the floor tom. And then once I hit the floor tom, I, I I may not tune to a particular note necessarily or pitch, but, um, I feel a certain resonance from the drum that all that ends up being in the same ballpark <laughs> pitch wise. So I know that's that's not real specific, but once I once I feel that resonance and how I like my generally I'm using a 14 by 14 floor tom. 16 has a different sound and a different way that it resonates. So I try to I, I like to feel the floor tom like in in my gut, <laughs> you know, like feel the essence of that, the lowest end that's possible of a 14 by 14 and still have tone. And then I'll probably tune it up just a touch because probably a, a little bit higher so that I can get the 
linear slash melodic effect of the the tom toms. I generally have two mounted on one floor, and um, I just like the interval to be um, wide enough between the tom toms that it can simulate a chord, um, and I. And the snare drum, I'll turn the snares off so that when I play that with the snares off, it also is maybe the top note or the top pitch in this four note chord of the four drums that I'm playing. Mm -hmm. And so um, sometimes it's, uh, it, it may be in fourths or it may, and sometimes it's not. And, sometimes, and I, I just, it ends up kind of in that ballpark a lot, but really it's, I'm just going by resonance and uh, distance of interval being enough that when I play the way that I play, you can hear the you know um, uses of, of pitches in a, in a more melodic linear kind of way. But at the same time, if I'm playing grooves, there's enough weight to the drums and enough oomph to them that they, they're not just uh, you know for playing melodies. You can, you can actually feel feel them. You know? Yeah, yeah. So I, I tune by feel and resonance. I think oftentimes. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm. In 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 thinking about listening to some of the records that you made, especially like in the earliest '90s, it sounded to me like on at least some of them you were using some two ply heads. Is that true? I was using um, like the is the um, what is the one that has the it's not the black dot, but the it's a is a dot underneath. Oh head. yeah, yeah. I can't remember what the name of that is. I, I know the head you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then I was using um, those the earlier fiber skin ones. I think they were kind of thick. Oh, okay. Too. Yeah. Were you just experimenting? And I was or... experimenting a lot. So it's when you talk about the the eighties and nineties, I would try this. I'd try that. I tried, <laughs> I tried all kinds of stuff. So yeah. 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 No, no, that, that's interesting. It was just a, <laughs> it was a sound that I heard, and I thought, like, man, that 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 sounds like a thicker head, you know. Which mm -hmm. which is, I mean, it sounded good, but it's just a slightly yeah. slightly different sound. Mm -hmm. When when it comes to cymbal sounds, you know, what what do you 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 and I have very similar tastes in cymbals, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and I, I was interested. To, I've never talked to you about why you you play the cymbals that you do, as far as their their general sound. Could you talk a little bit about why you choose those yeah. sounds? I choose the symbols. I've chosen the symbols I use because I feel they work in multiple contexts. And if you want to, if I'm playing uh, something that's, um, in other words, I can play them. I can play them at pianissimo, and I like this. What happens? I can play them at fortissimo, and I like what's happening. I can play them playing swinging straight ahead jazz, and I like it. I can play them those cymbals playing funk, R&B, and I like them, reggae, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> um, and so, um, and if it's just about sonic, if it's just about creating colors and sounds, I like them for that. So I, um, I tend to like cymbals that have a, a clarity, um, especially when we're talking about ride, ride cymbals. And really a cymbal is, I mean, we call them ride cymbals, but you can ride on anything. <laughs> a, a, a symbol is just a piece of metal that you can get a sound out of. So, and I always tell my students that the um, hi hats, you know, symbols are they're, they're not a function per se. You know, that's the hi hat is a is two symbols and it's a sound and how you utilize that sound is 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 what's important. So, I can ride on the top of a open the ride, the hi hats up and ride on that top symbol. I can ride on a crash symbol. I can ride on a splash cymbal. <laughs> you can, you know, yeah, but but for functional purposes, talking about ride cymbals, I like, I don't like them to be too washy and dark um, because I like clarity. Um, now, there can be a dark, a cymbal which someone would characterize or classify as dark pitch, but when you hit the stick on it, you hear clarity of attack. So that wouldn't bother me as much as hitting a cymbal and then the, the, uh, pattern getting lost in the wash of of sound <laughs> you know mm -hmm. yeah yeah for sure i i've always i i like darker sounding symbols myself but i i really and it took me a minute to really 
realize this, but I, I do like symbols that sort of speak above the piano, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And I, I think that's that clarity that you're talking about, which is... That's what I'm talking about. That's yeah. right. Yeah, it's important. I, it's, yeah, I, I do hear mm-hmm. you. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so if we could switch gears uh, once again, I, I'm, I'm interested to talk with you about, um, because as drummers, uh, bass players are very important people in our in our lives, and um, mm-hmm. you you've you've worked with some of the best and, and continue to do so. And I, I oftentimes I when I when I hear younger drummers or just drummers that are are a little less experienced, especially when they're playing, let's say at a jam session, and they're playing with people that they've never played with before. And you can really, you know, you get that sense that they're they they really don't quite know how to work with with people, especially people that are new to them, um, you know, right off the bat. So I wanted to I wanted to get your impressions of of how you deal with both working with uh, some of the great bassists as well as just anytime you have to play with a new bass player. Let's just mm-hmm. keep let's just keep it at bass players for now. Um, okay. All what right. are what are some of the things that that you're doing that you're thinking about when you work with with different bassists? Um. I like to make sure that there's a close enough physical proximity that I'm not hearing them from across the stage somewhere <laughs> as a first thing. Yeah. Um, and the close physical proximity allows for kind of more phrasing and breathing together, I think. And, the, and so I, I start there and then um, make sure that I can, that I'm hearing them with, with clarity and, and, uh, feeling them. It's like the drums. I tune for resonance and I can kind of feel it and resonating in my body. I like to feel, I like to feel the bass too. So I'll, I'll try to get, you know, the, the volume of the bass. If someone who's open to suggestions, you know, I might say, turn, turn down a little bit or turn up a little bit, uh, based on how we're situated so that I can get the sound. And sometimes I might, if, especially if the amplifier is being used, let's say, if I'm getting too much, I'll say, well, can you turn the amp away towards yourself or away from me or something like that? And then I'm still hearing it um, how I want. Uh, so that sometimes that'll happen instead of saying, turn up, turn down. Because I'm not really trying to control that person's um, view of how much volume they want. I'm just trying to control how much I'm getting. <laughs> mm-hmm. You see, so uh, and and so I want any new bass player to understand that it's not about me telling you how with how much volume to play, it's how much I want to have coming in my ear. <laughs> <You know>? Yeah, <laughs> so, absolutely. <laughs> and sometimes I need more. Sometimes I need less. So, um, uh, then in terms of approach to time, placement of beat and that kind of thing, um, it's everybody is different. You know, it's a, here we go again with yeah, <laughs> the yeah. uniqueness of each, of each thing. So if um, I have a general, generally a similar approach, I think no matter who it is, but um, small little incremental adjustments have to be made. And so if I'm playing with, um, if I was playing with Ron Carter or I was playing with Dave Holland, or if I was playing with Rufus Reed, or if I was playing with Peter Washington or, you know, I could just go all Chris McBride. Um, it's it's not necessarily me adjusting to each personality, um, so to speak. But I'm adjusting. I'm I'm in the moment, um, uh, making the attempt to merge m- my conception of beat with another person's conception of beat. So it would be, in a sense, almost like playing with another drummer, hmm. because the players are are articulating beat along with us. So if you think of it that way, then you you realize that it, you need to be able to hear each other in a certain kind of way in order to know how this is happening. So that's the first thing. And then some players have a heavier the way they hear their sound. The the beat has or their sound has more weight to it and others um, have a more mid-weight kind of sound and others, you know, play a lot in thumb position or the way they approach the bass is is more like that. You don't 
necessarily feel the resonance in here. And you have to make those adjustments. Sometimes if it's someone who has a lighter bass sound or one that's not as weighty, then I might um, play a little bit more of my bass drum in terms of just feeling this. Like if it's a 4-4 walking, I might allow my bass drum to resonate more on each beat so that I'm feeling the kind of resonance I like to feel while time is happening, as opposed to telling them, saying to them, you know, can you add more mid or bottom to your sound? Because that may not be the sound they want. So I'm not, I'm not interested in changing anybody. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no. I'm interested yes. in all, that's what they that's what they prefer to do. How am I going to do what I do with that in this situation today? Yeah, because yeah. <laughs> tomorrow's going to be different. And yesterday was different. You know, very true. <laughs> very true. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, a lot of these questions, I'm I'm thinking of uh, of of younger drummers who 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 need to hear right. s- stuff like this. <laughs> <laughs> so so thank you for 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 indulging me on on that. Um, mm-hmm. So you know, I, I you know we're we're we, we've got a few minutes left, and I wanted to uh, to to talk with you about uh, you know some of the some of the different musical experiences that you've had, and 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 things that you have learned from those specific experiences. And I guess we could maybe let's let's maybe start with uh, we've talked about Betty. How about mm-hmm. Ron Carter? Because you 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 started playing with Ron when you were relatively young. What are what That's are some right. of the things you really got from him as far as your playing? Mm-hmm. Well, um, it really, I really started to learn um, about the, how my sound affects his sound because he would always ask me about, he would always suggest certain tunings of the bass drum because, uh, you know, in a certain range that bass drum could wipe out, <laughs> you know, half of what's going on there, you know, and someone mm-hmm. who's as uh, adventurous and creative and you know, melodic linearly as, as, as Ron is, is not going to want those subtle ideas to be wiped out by uh, the bass drum, just kind of booming them out to sm- smithereens. <laughs> so <laughs> so um, I would experiment a lot with the tuning of my bass drum so that it was kind of work in tandem well with, with him. And then also just playing night after night with Ron gave me an opportunity to see how my um, rise symbol approach was working with a master like him in terms of placement of the beat and um, duration of the beat. And I just, I just put it under a microscope in a certain kind of way to, when I'm around those kind of guys, because this is how they think. And, um, you know, always wanting to get better with each performance to improve, you know, what's going on. I remember one time I was in Japan on tour with Ron and he, he had, this was back in the Walkman days and he had a, he had his headphones on and I said, I, and uh, we were in a car on like an hour long trip, I think maybe. And I asked him, I tapped him and I said, Ron, what are you listening to? So he, he took off the headphones and handed it to me and I put it on and it was Paul Chambers. <laughs> so, um, and I found it interesting because, you know, Ron, at that point, Ron was already, you know, considered a master basis. And, you know, uh, but when I looked at him, he said, he just looked at me and said, I'm still doing my homework. <laughs> yes, indeed. And, I, and that, that was inspiring, you know. <laughs> yeah. No, that's 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 wonderful to hear that because I'm, I'm certainly yeah. in the same boat. <laughs> Um, so I'm still doing my own work. <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure. Um, as far as, uh, let's see here, as far as playing with Tommy Flanagan goes, you mm. you had, you had you played with him for the better part of a ten decade. Or even, yeah, 10 years. Yeah. And uh, I, I wanted to talk with you a little bit about that. That, that was one of my, that was one of my, it still is one of my favorite piano trios, you and he and, mm. and Peter. And... Um, and you spent a lot of time with him, and uh, could you talk about some of the some of the things you got from him working with him for ten years? Yes, yes, I learned. Um, you know, again, I keep going back. To, I, I hear myself saying subtlety and nuance, and he was masterful. You know, the, the poet of the jazz piano. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, but at the same time, he had a he had a you know a, like um really really 
pointed and directed focus so that when it was time to bear down and really, you know, execute some some really um, intricate yet um, dynamic kinds of things. You know, I'm talking about the blood pop. When I say dynamic, I'm thinking about, you know, to make the hair stand up on the back of your neck, temples, blood pops, kind of those kind of lines and, and that kind of thing. He, he could really be extremely accurate and precise and on it with that kind of stuff, you know. And, and so I, I started to learn how, what a wide range of uh, possibilities existed in terms of sound, sound creation, the, you know, power, subtlety, nuance, um, d- dynamic range being wide, um, tempo range being really wide. And, you know, the people that I played with, that we've mentioned already, Betty Carter, Ron Carter, Tommy Flanagan, and there's so many more I could mention. Um, they they all have this kind of a, um, mastery of and desire to continually improve and expand those things. So I want to be able to play, you know, really soft, really fast, within, and I want to be able to play really soft, really at a really slow tempo. And they both have the same intensity. You know, they both have a similar kind of way of drawing in people because of the the intensity that they have. And then I want to be able to create full sounds without them being overbearing and oppressive. So if you know, start learning that, and I think I started talking about sound and how here we are coming back to it, but the sound that someone projects is the essence of who they are, how, how they, who they are as a being, you know, who they are as a musician, of course, but, you know, sound projection and sound creation. So I keep coming back to that. And it's, it's not about, um, particular, um, rhythmic aspects of things being the, at the forefront all the time. You can play a particular groove with the drums tuned one way or, or or by hitting the drums a certain way to create a certain sound and then play that exact same notated rhythmic groove with a different touch and a different sound and it'll it'll do something else so it's all about the sound that you project and and you consciously project that sound it's not just you hit you just let you don't you're not a, you're not I'm aware of where my hands are when I make a stroke in terms of distance from the head if, if I want a certain feeling, it's, it's closer. If I want another kind of feeling, they're further away. And that's not just a dynamic thing. It's a, it's, it's a resonance thing also, you know. It's yeah. not just for just more person, you know. Yeah, it's that. But <laughs> how does that impact? How does that sound impact? The ear, the body, you yourself, you know. Yeah. It, you that, feel that's... some resonance within your own body. That, that tells you something. You know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, I, I love I love that you're spending time talking about sound. I, one of the things I notice in, in so many younger drummers is they're so concerned with what they're playing, but not mm. how they're playing it. And therefore, what kind of sound are they getting? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, and man, it's it's really important. Um, I, I also wanted to ask you about your time with uh, the great John Burke's Dizzy Gillespie. Mm. Um because I know that Dizzy, in addition to being one of the, the great masters and innovators in this music, he was also a master of rhythm. And he, he was sure such was. a, he was, he seemed to be such a great teacher. Could you talk a little bit about your time with him and what you got from him? Man, Dizzy, you know, he, I, I, I don't know why people don't think about dancing when they think of, when I, when I think of Dizzy, it, the way he, the way he rhythmically interprets things, it, it's, it's like a dance. In a, in a way, you know, and so, and you can tell by the way, and you know, he would play conga sometimes later on, and he would he would play that stick, the rhythm stick, yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. <laughs> but he, there's a certain when I hear Dizzy or, or when I would play with him, I would there's a certain dance ability that would happen within the the music that would happen when he would play, and also sound. He, I remember the first time I played with him, you know, the very first time. Um, after the first uh, song, uh, his first solo, let me see if I can get it accurately how it happened. You know, I was playing time, probably something medium, and um, on my ride cymbal, 
and he was standing just to the right of that right symbol. And then I would play this symbol over here, and then I had another symbol here. So I, as I was moving around, um, he noted, he he kind of was listening, and then he pointed to one symbol in particular, and, and he was like, that one, that one. And he liked <laughs> whatever whatever that symbol did, he, he liked that one. He, he It wasn't that he was saying, don't play the other ones. He was, he was saying, when I play my solos, I like I like what this one does. <laughs> wow. You know? He took a moment to just say that. And so whenever he would play, I would kind of mostly 90% stay over there on that one, aside from the little crashes, little things on the other ones, because I knew that he, there was something about the character of, of those overtones or that symbol that he liked. Wow. You know, so he, he was listening for that and made it clear to me that he liked that one. Wow, man did 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 he did he talk to you about certain grooves and certain rhythms to play at all? I, I've always been curious about that. He wouldn't. He didn't talk necessarily. He would. He would sing them. He would sing the rhythm how he wanted it to be. And while he was singing, he he would always be moving. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's what I mean. It's like he would say, you know, and that like and and so then. I was like, okay, it's it's about the way it feels. It's not it's not or you're not playing this rhythm exactly, this sixteenth note. It's right. not it's how it feels. <laughs> right. Wow. Man, that's a, that's yeah. that's incredible. It, it those all those masters, they were such rhythmic masters, no matter what instrument Definitely. they they played. And and they yeah. had such a I'm I have i have been fortunate to play with a few of those guys and man, it's it's amazing how their playing just sort of takes the whole band and just zeroes them into that groove. Yeah. Ray it's Brown such... was a perfect example of that. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. I could I would just be smiling ear to ear <laughs> playing with Ray Brown <laughs> because it was so emphatically this is what it is <laughs> you know there was no doubting <laughs> yeah you know and i remember the first time i played with mccoy tyner i i was kind of surprised because you know mccoy has so much energy and so you know when you think of him you think of this forward momentum but when i sat down to play with him i had to kind of sit back and widen my conception of the beat rather than that edgy on top thing wow you know it was more and then i tried started thinking about it and all these years he played with elvin and all of that and there was there was a wideness to the beat that i had to breathe and settle into so that i wouldn't be too on top with him wow you yeah know? yeah <laughs> you, you you can definitely hear that beautiful earthiness of his playing on the record yeah. but yeah. you know playing with him i'm sure was <laughs> was quite a different experience yeah. which which brings me i know we only have we're pretty much out of time but oh, that's all right go I, ahead i just want to say because you mentioned that about so I noticed as I as I as I became a part of this um, musical family <laughs> and started to grow musically from the time I left Phoenix um, to now, one of the things I always tell my students about is it's one thing to, to when you listen to records you get one conception of a what a, a musician a particular musician or a particular band is doing. And then if you hear that band live in person right in front of them, you, there's something else added to your, your awareness of the, that band's possibilities, right? Mm -hmm. Then if you um, play with that, with people, those, that same band in a con certain context, you get another awareness or conception of what's actually going on there and then if you go in the recording studio <laughs> with them and where things are you know slowed down there's no audience and then you get to see the inner workings of how things work you get another conception of what it takes to make that band and that music work you know yeah. one thing to sit in on a tune or play one tune or or play one gig but then to to play regularly night after night after night or to go in the studio so um for young musicians, be careful about, you know, forming an opinion or concept about a player or a band or just on one hearing in one context, one night. <laughs> you know what I mean? You got to yeah. hear somebody 10, 20, 30 times before you begin to get something. I'm talking about in person, if you can. Yeah. You know, you know that's... Or repeated, repeated listenings of recordings, of, of course, but, you know, go and 
sit and watch. You know, I, I the first time I saw Art Blakey or Max Roach or Roy Haynes or Tony Williams or any of them, it 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 altered a little bit the conception of what you hear on the records. <laughs> You know? Yeah, <laughs> you know it does. You're 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 totally yeah. right about that. Um, yeah. Well, since 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 we only got a couple minutes left, I I wanted to end and just ask you, what what kind of things are you working on today? Do you still practice? And if so, what yeah. are some of the things you work on? Um, I find myself um, doing certain things consistently. Like um, I'll still just take a ride symbol and just play the ride symbol. I still do that, and I'll see how many different sounds and variations I can get and rhythmic rhythmic variety and different and tonal possibilities of if I play the cymbal here or there or there or there. So I still do that. Um, I still work on some rudimental things. Um, I try to do them utilizing the whole drum set rather than just on a snare drum since I'm at a drum set most of the time. <laughs> I do that. Um, and I, I really work on um, uh, just I, let's say let's say I set a metronome at a certain beat per minute or whatever, and I I try to see how many different conceptions of feel I can establish between clicks. You know, hmm. so maybe I maybe I want to establish a, a hip hoppy, for want of a better term, because I can't think of another way to describe it, like a sixteenth note hi hat that kind of mm. thing between these beats or so I'm not thinking genre necessarily but I'm just but I'm just thinking you know rhythmic variety and 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 uh, the amount of um, velocity maybe I might be a word that comes to mind so um, then I might uh, experiment with um, you know an ostinato is happening and then what I'm doing on top of it I'm so I'm still you know, it's just a variety of things. There's no one thing, but sure. I do still um, spend some time, take some time to sit down and just, you know, continue to explore. Is the way I'll put it. The drums, yeah, and, and the situations. Uh, I'll make sure that I spend some time with the brushes too. Just, just to. <laughs> if you don't spend time with the brushes, they spend time with you. I've noticed that. <laughs> <laughs> They are yeah. unforgiving. <laughs> Beautiful, man. I, I, I also I also listen to try to keep my ear open to what you know people are listening to and what people are playing. So even if it's some music that I'm not necessarily going to find myself playing, you know you don't want to you don't want to limit what you hear or how uh, you know the types of music that you hear. Just remain open. Um, I had to tell a young drummer, a high school drummer, one time to to remain open because he just kept talking about one specific era period or whatever. I'm like, yeah, but you know, you're 15. You don't listen <laughs> to what your peers. What are the kids listening to? Listen to everything. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, don't that's do good it advice. To <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. That's, that's wonderful <laughs> advice. So uh, what do you have coming up, man, that you might want to let people know about as far as gigs or recordings, whatnot? Um, let's see what's coming up. Um, I have a, I put together a trio here in Phoenix that I play with often called the Power Trio, which is organ, guitar, and drums. I like the organ trio concept. Michael Coker is the organist, oh, and yeah. Stan Sorens, the uh, guitarist. So we we play um, often here. So I have a gig coming up on July third with the Power Trio at the Nash, which is yes. the establishment here in Phoenix, which is named in my honor. And um, then uh, I just. I have a recording session coming up in July uh, with Houston Person, the great tenor saxophonist. Um, and then I have a, a gig at the 92nd Street Y, uh, which is a, they have a summer series, jazz series that Bill Charlap is the curator of. And right. so one of the nights I'm doing that. The Newport Jazz Festival is coming up. I'm doing that. Um, so, you know, just starting to things are starting to kind of come back into the fold here and yeah, busyness man. is creeping in so that's a good thing it is a good yeah. thing well that's wonderful and man the tenth, and it's the 10th anniversary of the nash this year so oh wow it's 10 years already that's amazing yeah. man yeah so my my group which is you know my quintet will be featured this year as a during the 10th anniversary so i'm looking forward to you know reuniting with my 
my quintet to play this yeah, year. Yeah, man. Yeah. Fantastic. Man, thank you so much for, for spending time with us today. I know uh, I know there's there's going to be a lot of good, uh, good stuff that uh, drummers who watch this are going to get from it, man. So I, I really appreciate it. All right. All right. Well, you take good care, and thanks for having me. Absolutely, man. We'll, we'll get you back soon. Thank you. Right. Take care. That's it for this week's episode. Hope you enjoyed that chat between Tom and Lewis. If you like the show, please head over to iTunes or Spotify or YouTube or wherever you get this podcast. Drop us a five-star rating. Give us a review if you don't mind. That does help spread the word to get this show into the ears of more drummers around the world. All right, I'll be back next week, so have a good one. See ya.